Hey guys, in this video, we're going to talk about spirometry, what it is, how to do it, and why it's important for metabolic testing. All right, Andrew, let's kick it off with the first question that I have for you today is uh, what is spirometry and why it is important for metabolic testing? Uh, great. Okay. So spirometry is simply just a measure of lung function. Uh, there's a, there are a number of pulmonary function tests that we can do in, in the laboratory and in the medical system. Uh, the spirometry is really a, a basic measurement of the volumes and the flow of air in and out of the lungs uh, in, a sing, in a single simple test. All right. So in a test like this, there's many metrics that usually come out of those reports, depending on the device that you're using. So what metrics do we want to focus on when we're doing those? Yeah, so the most common ones uh, are, are how, how big a breath you can take. That's typically called a, a forced vital capacity. But in a simple, a more simple spirometer, um, most of them will measure an FEV6. And that is the forced expiratory volume that you can blow in over a six second period. Mm -hmm. And those, that has been, a, has been documented as a very good approximation of your vital capacity, which is the total amount of air you can move through your lungs. So FEV6 is, is one of the, is the prime ones. The other one is FEV1, which forces uh, obviously um, off of this, the same similar kind of uh, nomenclature. FEV1 is forced expiratory volume in the first second of breath. And most of the air that you blow out when you do a forceful exhalation, and this is maximal exhalations, is pushed out in that first second. So to quantify that, they also form a ratio. So those two numbers are quite often used in a ratio, FEV1 over FEV6. Mm -hmm. And that gives you a percent or a, or a decimal value of what volume is, are you able to move in the first second compared to what your total volume is. So if and, we, so if we yeah. go back to the first metric, the FVC or FEV6, uh, from what I understand, they can be used interchangeably. They're very close to one another. Um, what are we looking at? How do we judge the value that we get out of this test? How do we interpret it? Uh, yeah, so the way the test is done is, is uh, an athlete or a patient is, uh, coached to take as big a breath as they can in and then blow out as forcefully as they can for as long as they can and continue until there is no airflow. Mm -hmm. uh, this, the, the medical grade sensors are, are very accurate at picking up even small flow. Um, so the FVC numbers that they get tend to be a little bit larger, uh, but the FEV6, even simple, small handheld spirometers do a very good job of, of accurately measuring it and repeatedly measuring it. Uh, most athletes will, will, if they do it repeatedly, will get better over the first two or three breaths because they learn how to blow out hard. Most people never do this in their, in their typical life to take the, an absolutely maximal breath in and blow as hard as they can. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's how the test is performed, single breath, deep in as you can, as hard as you can out for as long as you can until there's no airflow. Then take a rest, repeat it as many times until you, and what you're trying to see is the highest numbers or are the, are the numbers you're looking for. And you're looking for repeatability. If you have, if you have two maximal tests and they're exactly the same, you know that you've actually got a, an accurate and, and, and valid result. Yeah, that's what I like to do. I usually do at least one or two trials to get the person accustomed to the movement. Cause like you said, it's not a natural thing to do. And then, like you said, once you get two or three in a row that are very consistent with one another, and there's actually usually information on the report itself about how close they are between the tests. So you can be sure the val validity of the, the data, then, um, then it's, it's, it's pretty straightforward to do it. So once I get that, uh, FEV six, let's say, um, and that FEV one. What do I what do I compare it to to know if it's good, bad, enough, or not for a given person? Yeah, so there are there are um, normalized charts which I think we'll be able to include in this in this um, video. Mm -hmm. uh, remember that your lungs uh, form a triangle. So the taller you are, the larger the triangle, and the bigger the volumes. So um, FEV6 is, is very closely correlated to height. So a shorter person will have smaller, a smaller triangle and smaller lungs. They'll have a smaller FEV6. The taller you are, the larger the expected FEV6. 
we know that with training, this can be improved because it's also dependent on how much diaphragmatic motion you can get mm -hmm. and how, um, how much intercostal and costal vertebral motion you can get. And that's the angles and the motion of the ribs between each other and how the ribs attach to your spinal, um, uh, your spinal column. So those, those are the three main uh, factors that affect FEV6 height, cost of vertebral motion, and intercostal motion. Sorry, four, and diaphragmatic motion. So, right, those, so you, four, those four factors contribute to FEV6. So you have those four, and then for the FEV1, for that first second of forced exhalation, uh, can you tell us a bit more about this one? And do we do the same? Do we compare this to the normalized charts? Uh, we do, although um, because of the training that we've seen done with ASI, there's a huge variety of, of what you can see in FEV1. And so FEV1 really is a better measure of the function of the musculature and the ability to force freely exhale air. There is some limitation that the greatest limitation uh, in a healthy person is the size of their airways. So again, smaller people will not be able to push out as much air as a, as a bigger human being. So the size, and it really is the size of the trachea. That's the smallest part of the airway system is through the trachea. So people with a large, thick neck with a with a big air pipe can push out a lot of air very quickly if you're small or young or or a petite person you are going to have a smaller trachea and not be able to push out as much air in that first second mm -hmm. and then you talked about that ratio between those two values and that in the normalized charts you can also find uh, those values, what you want to see for different demographics, different uh, sizes, and uh, depending on the spirometer that you're going to use, they even include uh, those data uh, tables and charts inside their app so that once you enter your personal information, it actually tells you relative to the mean or the average for your height, size, age, sex, and uh, et cetera. It's going to tell you how you compare, so you don't even have to go and type in those numbers in the tables. Absolutely. And those numbers can um, vary a fair bit, uh, again, very dramatically between uh, size of the individual, height of the individual, age of the individual, because we see a decreasing FEV1 to FEV6 ratio as people get older. But there's, all, there's an even more dramatic difference in trained versus untrained. So people who, who are athletically trained and breathe strong through, through different forms of training, whether you're cycling, running, or rowing, or any endurance sport, those people will have higher values of FEV1 because they have developed the musculature to blow air harder. Uh, and so we see differences um, of 5 to 10% difference in those values of, of the ratios between trained and untrained people at all ages. And a, uh, in the older athletically trained people, there's a less of a drop in performance uh, if, they, if they continue to train into their 50s, 60s, and even, even in athletes in their 70s. All right, very interesting. I've been using, for non-trained people, I've been using 100% of the average uh, for their size as the baseline. And then for athletes and trained people, I've been using 110. Uh, so somebody who's trained and who has less than 110% of what they should have for their size, I, I'll qualify them as slightly maybe limited on their on their capacity, does that make sense? And that totally, that matches the literature that, that, that there's, there is some very good studies that back up that. There's, they're relative, most of them are relatively small studies, hundreds of people, uh, one had about a thousand people in it. Mm -hmm. um, but that 10% but that difference in the expectation that your athletes are 10% better than, than average is, is fits pretty, fairly accurately with what the studies have shown. All right. Fantastic. So for anybody who wants more information on spirometry, how to conduct the test, where those tables are, and maybe even some research papers, you can check out the description of this video. Um, make sure you like the video. And if you have any questions about spirometry, uh, post them in the comments below. We'll look forward to uh, replying to them and we'll see you in the next video.